All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here tonight. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, we're going to do things a little bit different tonight. Uh, we're going to, uh, I've never tried to teach sitting down, so this ought to be really interesting. I'll be like real antsy and getting up, and, and it'll, be, uh, it'll be different. But uh, yeah, so I want, I want tonight to be real different. I want it to have a very different feel as we come and we have an important conversation. And I, t- I tell you, um, one of the things that I, I truly believe in, uh, in all of my years of kind of doing this and, and everything is, is I, I, I totally believe that God in the conversations as we are working on a message together and as the other guys are working on a message together with God, that, that God will guide us to the things that he wants us to talk about. And so we put a lot of work, the three of us, I f- feel like the microphone is cutting out there. All right, uh, we put a lot of work into uh, message prep um, and really what does God want to say. And so we know uh, several days in advance kind of what we're going to say and how we're going to do it and all that other stuff. And tonight is one of those rare nights when I didn't do that. Um, and I came up with uh, just lots of different uh, bullet points and lots of things that uh, maybe God will lead me to in our conversation tonight. Uh, and uh, I, this could be the longest message I've ever given. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, <laughs> because I just really want to follow his leading and his guidance tonight as we just kind of really have an honest conversation. And so it's going to depend on how many stories and rabbit trails uh, Todd goes on tonight. And I hope that's okay with everybody. Because uh, I, I just, I want us really, and the reason why we're kind of doing it this way, um, I, I want it to feel like we're sitting in the living room just having an honest conversation and really talking about some, some stuff that's, that's pretty deep about you know, where, where we are, uh, my journey, our journey, um, just kind of what we need to do uh, pushing forward. And so I, I want to start just a little bit with my story because I know that many of you don't know uh, my story and, and we could spend several hours just kind of going through my story and I don't want to do that, but um, I came to faith early uh, in my life, in my, in my teenage years. Um, we were a part of a charismatic Catholic church, uh, which is an hour-long discussion all in itself. Uh, and so for me, I grew up in a w- way that I did not realize was weird until later on. Uh, I just thought it was normal. And so in our faith expression, we had the priest and we had all of the ceremonies that Catholic churches do. And at the same time, we had a full praise band and people raising their hands and speaking in tongues. And, and I didn't realize that that was weird until I get, went to college and went to other Catholic churches churches and was like, wait a minute, this is not, where's the band, where's this, where's that? Uh, so uh, early on uh, in, in my uh, teenage years, my, my mom and dad came to faith in their early 30s, so before that we didn't really have any faith expression, and so when they came to faith and it was completely sold out, and many of you had the pleasure of knowing my, my folks and their spiritual journey, and when they were sold out, the rest of us became sold out uh, alongside of them and really were very active in our faith. Um, at least until I went to college, as many of our, our stories, if you grew up in the church, uh, your college years, your 20s, uh, we have a tendency to kind of walk away from the faith and try to experience the world a little bit. And when I met my wife, we, we jokingly uh, said uh, we found our permanent party partner, and that was about it. We, didn't, we weren't really uh, active in our faith. Uh, we just, uh, you know, uh, experienced life uh, together. But we came back to faith um, in, the, in uh, 1993, a very specific year. Uh, we were pregnant with our very first uh, child, and we lost that child, uh, had a miscarriage. Uh, and the church that we were attending at that time, because that's what you did in small town Nebraska, you had to go to church because everybody knew who went to church and who didn't. Uh, and as public school teachers, you, you, you went to church. And so uh, we had no idea that in that very traumatic moment, we would be introduced to what it was like to actually be a believer. And at that moment, people didn't just tell us about Jesus, they showed us Jesus. And it was very transformative in our life. Um, very uh, important moment uh, in our life. And so when we moved here uh, a few months later, we were once again pregnant and expecting our first child. This would be CJ. Uh, I had just graduated from college. Uh, my mom and dad had moved out to Greeley. We were still in Nebraska. And uh, uh, mom called me on the phone one day and said, um, well, you're pregnant with the first grandbaby. 
and you just graduated from college and you got to find a job anyway, so you might as well move out here. And I said, yes, ma'am, and we've been here ever since because that's... So what you do, you listen to your mama, and uh, so been here ever since, and uh, we started a- attending a church here in town, and just kind of growing in our faith, and um, eventually we-, we started kind of volunteering uh, in ministry, Lindy volunteered first, and, and dragged me into it, um, and so finally in, in 1999, um, I decided to go into ministry, decided to- that this is what I wanted to do uh, with my life, was to love people and serve people, and and so I went to Denver Seminary uh, and started working on my master's degree at Denver Seminary. And two things Im- important happened in, the, in those moments that I, that I want to kind of begin our conversation with. I think the most important thing is I began to really have some angst inside of me. I'm going to use the word angst a lot. I hope you know what that word means. It just means this discontent inside of you that something just isn't right. And I started to have this angst inside of me because the Jesus that I was studying, the church that I was studying, was not the church that I was experiencing, wasn't the Jesus that I was experiencing. And so I really had this angst between, is what I read real? Is what I'm studying real? Because it's not what I'm experiencing in the American church. It's not what I'm experiencing in my church. It's not what I'm seeing. There's this disconnect, and it really really bothered me and really created this angst inside of me. The second thing that happened is in your last semester at Denver Seminary, at least at this point, um, the school doesn't do this anymore that I'm aware of, but at this point, um, in your last semester, you have to take this series of hundreds of hundreds of, of questions, these tests, and they're all about personality and spiritual gifts and all these sorts of things, and they compile them together, and, they, and there is a counselor whose entire job is to tell you your place in the body of Christ. Talk about some pressure, right? Their whole job is basically to tell you, and this is what you're supposed to do with the rest of your life, right? And uh, so I remember going into this counselor. Once again, I'm at the last semester. Going into this counselor, and um, I'm meeting him for the very first time. And he shakes my hand and says, now, what was your name again? (laughs) And, And I told him my name. And so he's shuffling around these papers on his desk, and he finds my manila envelope, and he, and he opens it up and goes, oh, that's right, you're the easy one, and closes it. I'm not exactly sure what this means at this moment. I'm like, is that good? Is that bad? You know, what does it mean? And he says this, and I am quoting as verbatim as I can. Uh, he said, um, you're the easy one because people like you don't go into ministry. <laughs> Couldn't we have this the first semester? Not the last semester. This is not a good sign. And he says, no, 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 hear me out. He said, people like you go into Fortune 500 companies. They are people who are dreamers and, and entrepreneurs, and they are people who will push buttons and, and, and guide culture, and the church will drive you insane And because the church doesn't like to move. And you will always be at odds at the church. And so my suggestion, if you want to be part of the body of Christ, is that you need to start a church. And you need to create something that is unique and different and something that fuels you. And then you can't stop there. You need to constantly be creating new things and and uh, because the church is going to drive you crazy. Because the church doesn't like to move and the church doesn't like change. And it was in that moment, really, that I began to have this, this reality inside of me that began to really push my buttons, so I have this angst, and now I have this kind of direction. And I remember going back to my senior pastor and just really having this heart-to-heart with him, and he says, I, I absolutely um, agree with everything that he said and that we need to start thinking about planting a church, and, and Waypoints begins to, to birth out of these conversations, and 10 of us begin to, to really have these conversations about what in the world does the church need to do? What, what would a new church look like? And the very top of the thing, right at the very top of the list, has to be, it has to be different. And so we come up with the name Waypoints, and if you're unfamiliar about what in the world that name means, a Waypoint is a non-movable object that people use to guide their journey. And so sailors use the stars, pioneers as they came across uh, this land. They'd be like, there's Chimney Rock and there's Castle Rock. They would use these non-movable objects to help guide their journey. And so um, 
with that, we began to really create this kind of nautical theme, and that's why ships are prevalent and, and have been a, a part of our motif, because we believe that we are just trying, we, we don't have a direct path that God is taking us on. There, there, there's not a path. We are in the open sea, and we need to adjust our, our sails to the blowing of the wind of God. And that's always been our, our kind of, you know, this is who we are. We want to make sure that we are just sensitive to what God's doing and making sure to be guiding those sorts of directions. And so we began Waypoints in October of 2003, almost 18 years ago. And we began to use this catchphrase, a different kind of biblical faith community. Different, different than what you see on a Sunday morning. Different than what people are used to. And I remember, um, oh man, I'm already on my first tangent. I remember when uh, the Greeley Tribune came to interview me about this new church. And we were sitting in the office and she said, okay, so who are you trying to reach? And I said, no one. And she's, she's writing in her paper and she stops and she looks up to me. She's like, what? And I said, it's not about who we're trying to reach. It's about who we're trying to become. We want to become a community that accepts people for who they are. We want to become a community that is wholeheartedly sold out for Jesus. We want to become a community that, that just loves people, that is, that, that is different than these other expressions in a more traditional sort of church. And, and so we set out, and immediately we're going to do things different, right? We're going, to, we're going to start on a Tuesday night. We quickly added Friday nights behind that. There are plenty of wonderful churches on a Sunday morning. We want to go reach people who have never heard the gospel, who have been hurt by church, who are not currently, you know, um, active in their faith. Uh, if they are and Sunday morning works for them, then awesome. Go to one of those amazing churches out there. We want to reach everybody else, and uh, we want to leave the weekends for family. I was so tired of people getting guilt. Why weren't you in church? Well, I was camping with my kids. You should be in church. No, you should be camping with your kids, right? You should be having a relationship with your children and the round tables and stopping the message of having group discussion and serving meals and accepting and loving people just the way that they are. And we started out very, very different. And we had some amazing things, some, some incredible life changes over these last 18 years. Many of you have experienced just drastic life change, uh, you know, baptisms, growth in numbers, growth uh, in individual people's lives. And let me tell you, it has not been easy. It has not been easy uh, so far on this journey, and it won't be easy going forward in this journey. Uh, we have faced some tremendous hard times, uh, people going back to their old life, uh, people passing away, people leaving, leaving the faith, leaving the community, people leaving uh, the, the city, moving away. And along the way, we've had to fight for the culture that we wanted. No one told me that in seminary. No one ever told me how much time I would spend fighting for a culture and defending a culture. And what I mean by that is throughout these 18 years, um, Satan has continued to try to just infiltrate the community with very religious people and try, well, this is what you need to do and this is what you need to do. And we've had to fight against that. There have been um, people who have come in and tried to just judge what we're doing and change what we're doing. Uh, and we've had to politely say, this is probably not the right place for you. And just really trying to keep our culture where acceptance and love and second chances and third chances and 47th chances is part of our culture and doing all of those sorts of things because religion will always try to fight its way in. But that's not how we do things, and we've always done it this way, and religion loves to do that. And loving people is hard. I don't know if you realize that or not, but being a person filled with grace and loving people and trying to be Jesus to people is stinking hard. It is hard because we're messes, and it is absolute messy. And being a community that dives into the mess is hard. And along the way, we as leaders, we have, as a community, we've had to make super hard decisions from moving to the armory. If you were a part of that crazy thing where, where we're in our buildings and, our, and we loved where we were and 
the landlord tripling our rent to the next lease and going, geez, where are we going to go? And then God really giving me this crazy vision for this place and you walking in for the first time going, Todd needs a UA because he's on drugs. There's no way. Uh, and then the whole nine months worth or six months worth of work just to get occupancy in this building and just all these stupid and just crazy hard things that we've had to face as a community. And I've always appreciated how our leadership has been willing to ask the hard questions, be willing to make the hard decisions, be willing to risk, be willing to step into the unknown to adjust our sails as we sense the wind of God blowing in different directions. And I'll give you one classic uh, example. Um, Digital community. About, oh geez, well, we've been doing digital community or at least just streaming our video stuff for about, I don't know, about 11, 12 years. But about six years ago, we made the decision, and, and if you've been around, you, you, you heard us say that, that we wanted to create a digital online community and really do a good job of creating like digital content and having YouTube and Facebook and Vimeo, I mean, just all these sorts of things to try to get the word, of, to go to the ends of the earth. And just to give you an example uh, of, of two things of why that was so leading edge well, three things. First of all, we are a really small community who has to squeeze all of our pennies together. We, we've never been a wealthy community. And so all of a sudden making a decision that we're going to invest in people who aren't here and don't even live in the Greeley area but live virtually, that was gutsy. Absolutely gutsy. But to give you an idea, just on our YouTube channel, we've had over 11,442 views of the messages. Um, Vimeo's over, you know, 3,000, I'm not even counting Facebook. I mean, this stuff, it, it is so wild when you get on, like, the, the, the page that says, here are where people are watching the video, and you see people in Asia and Africa and stuff like that tuning in, that stuff's crazy. And so people were like, I, I, Todd, why are we investing money in this? Why are we spending time and effort in this? Because we never know how the gospel is going to be used by us stepping out and us risking. And then the third thing that shows us how I just truly believe that the elders were really listening to God because all of a sudden COVID hits and every church is scrambling to get online. And you would not believe. So my, my, my son at the time was working for a company that sold the equipment for churches to go online. Everything was backordered because every church was like, oh, and they were panicking. And we're like, Psst, whatever. We've been doing this for years. That's good. It's no problem. And I was just so thankful that leadership was like, let's, let's think forward. Let's think what does the world need? What does the culture need? What does the church need? And let's think forward and let's do that. And that willingness to risk. And I got to tell you, the church as a whole, the American church, does not do change well. On average, the, the studies that they told us in seminary and everything, is the church is about 30 years behind the culture. It just is. It's always been that way. And if your church is, always, is continuing to do the same thing it was 10 years ago, then shame on it. Now, I know we were like, but we've always done it that way, you know, and, and also, where's the top 10, and why, why aren't we holding hands in a big circle and praying, and for you old school people, and why aren't we doing this, and why aren't we doing it, but we've always done it that way. Uh, yeah, well, tough, I'm sorry, it's never coming back, and it's not coming back, and I don't, I don't mean to be, be rude with that, here's why, your church has to change with the culture, Period. Your church has to do whatever it takes to reach other people. And if you're still doing the same thing you were doing 18 years ago or 10 years ago or five years ago, guess what? The culture has moved on. And so you're behind. And you're doing stuff that is irrelevant to the people that you're trying to bring to Jesus. But we in the church, we don't like to change. Mm -mm, don't you dare change. And so we have a phrase, sacred cows, right? Sacred cows. We were a part of a church that if you moved a chair six inches, they'd be like, why'd you move my grandpa's chair? Because it had a name tag on it. 
We dedicated that to my grandpa in 1963. Don't you dare move that chair. Right? That's a true story, by the way. All right? People are set in their ways, and that's not the way the world works. We love our comfort in the church, and that's why the church is irrelevant to the world. Because we've made the church about us instead of about them. And so here's the truth. The presentation of the gospel should always be changing. It should always be changing. The truth of the gospel should never change. But the presentation of the gospel should always change. And so you should know that your elders, every time they get together, they're praying. They're saying, okay, what do we need to change? What do we need to do to reach other people for Jesus? What do we need to do? How do we need to continue to push? How do we continue to change? We're not going to sit still because we are not doing church. We're being the church. There's a huge difference. There's a huge difference. Now, all of this was true before COVID, but now it's even more true. Now, I tell you what, COVID has brought change upon our world in a way none of us could have foreseen. None of us. It, it, uh, that, that, man, when COVID hit, everything changed. In fact, the rules changed. And when it changed, the speed of change got even faster. And then we had political division like we've never seen and still continuing to grow, cultural changes through social movements, Black Lives Matter, LGBTQ, Roe versus Wade, you know, economic change. And we just continued to plow through and plow through. The people who study church said that one-third of the American church left during COVID and will never be back. If you're at 50% attendance now, you are at the top of churches today. 50% of your attendance. It's absolutely crazy. People are leaving the evangelical American church faster than ever before in the history of the church. That's not okay. It's not okay. And it should not be okay with you. It should not be okay with me. And if you are okay with that, then I got to tell you, you're missing the entire point of Christianity. So we have to constantly be asking ourselves, what do we do? How, how, do, how do we reach people? How do we love people? How do we advance the truth of Jesus? How do we continue to grow in our own faith, help other people grow in their faith? And those are the questions that your leadership wrestles through all of the time. In fact, for the last six months, your elder team has been meeting every other week for three hours at a time, praying. Dreaming, listening. And one of the questions that one of them brought up, it was so good. It's not just how does the gospel need to be presented today, but what does the church need to look like 20 years from now? And let's do that. Let's do that now. Let's not be 30 years behind the culture. Let's be 20 years in front of the culture. What does it need? And let's do that. Now, in order for us to find that answer, we actually need to turn to Scripture, and we need to look at it. So on your tables, we've put a few more boxes, or uh, Bibles. I want everybody to grab a physical Bible. We're not going to use you version today. You can put that digital stuff down. And I want you to grab a pin out of the little cup holder, because you're going to mark in these Bibles. <gasps> I know. Sacrilegious, isn't it? Crazy. Crazy. And to ask ourselves, what in the world does church need to look like? We need to see one of the clearest texts on church that we have in the New Testament. So would you all please turn to the book of Acts, chapter 2. And when somebody, I forgot to write down the page number, so when somebody finds that page number, shout it out to everybody else. Acts, chapter 2. 655. Bingo. All right. 655. All right. Now, let me remind you a little bit of the setting. If it's been a while since you've read Acts, 
The resurrected Jesus has just spent the last 40 days with his people, talking to them, teaching them, guiding them. And Jesus tells the crowd, I need to leave. I need to ascend back into heaven. But I will send the Holy Spirit to you. And you are to wait in the city of Jerusalem until that happens. And when the Holy Spirit comes, he says, verse 8, that you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, to the ends of the earth. So the disciples then hang out for roughly about 10 days, and they are gathered in the upper room and they are praying, when all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit just absolutely invades the space and fills every single one of them on what we refer to as Pentecost. They get up and they walk to the temple, these people who are gathered in the upper room, and they begin to tell everyone the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit fills them in such a way that they are speaking literally in different languages so that every person who is in the temple hears the gospel message in their native language. And the scriptures tell us that 3,000 people come to faith in that first day. Wow. Then, in verse 42, that's where we're going to pick up the story. Now, I want you to take your pen because I'm going to have you circle some specific words. If you're joining us online, I hope you have a physical Bible and I hope you have a physical pen because you need to circle some words, okay? Okay. Here we go. I'm reading out of the New Living Translation, so follow along. All the believers devoted themselves. Go ahead and circle the word devoted. Go ahead and circle it. If your pen doesn't work, grab another one, all right? What did they devote themselves to? It says here, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. All right, go ahead and circle the word word teaching. Devoted and teaching. And to fellowship, ah, it's a churchy word. Basically, they devoted themselves to community, relationships. So go ahead and circle that. And to sharing meals. Let's go ahead and circle that too. And to prayer. Hmm, let's circle that one. So they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching to fellowship, to sharing meals, and to pray. Okay, so you should have those things circled. Now, what is the result of doing church that way? Remember, 3,000 people. Okay? A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. All the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property, possessions, and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, as was their Jewish practice, met in homes. Go ahead and circle that word, homes. For the Lord's Supper and sharing their meals with great joy and generosity, all while praising God and enjoying the fellowship or the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added, go ahead and circle that one, added to their fellowship, their communities, those who were being saved. Leave your Bibles open for a moment. I'm just going to take a couple of seconds here. Remember earlier in my story, I talked about this deep angst that I was feeling. That the God that I was studying, the church that I was studying, was not the church I was experiencing. And I've learned over these last 20 years that God really speaks to Todd when I feel a lot of angst about a situation. When I feel that angst, something just ain't right, I have learned that's actually God. That's how he speaks to me as I'm frustrated. This is one of those passages that I read in that moment. And 
uh, or during that, that time in my life. And I have reread this passage hundreds of times. And even today, as I read this right now with you, I have this deep angst. Because as I read this, something doesn't feel right inside of my soul. And do you know why? Because I'm not experiencing this. Are you? Well, let's make it a checklist, all right? A deep sense of awe came over all of them, and the apostles performed miraculous signs and wonders. No, I can't check that off. I'm not experiencing that. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. No, I'm not experiencing that. I can't check that off. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared meals with great joy and generosity. No, no, I'm not experiencing that. All while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all people. (laughs) Nope, we're not experiencing that. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Mm, No, not experiencing that. Why aren't we experiencing these things? Why aren't we experiencing these things on a normal basis? Why isn't this an everyday experience? Was it just for Acts chapter 2? I don't think so. I, I don't think so. Do you know why we're not experiencing these things anymore? Because the church isn't about these things anymore. In the beginning, they didn't have a Bible. And so they would gather together to hear stories, to learn from the apostles. And all the believers dedicated themselves. All these brand new people were like, man, tell me about Jesus. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They didn't devote themselves to the Bible because the Bible didn't exist. And remember, we just had this series just at the beginning of the summer, right? The Bible did not exist, right? So they came together to share stories. Now, you may remember from June, if you were here during that, right? Constantine was the first Christian ruler, if you will, roughly 300 A.D., not to bore you with history here. That's a long time. Right? So the early church is happening, right? Between the, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the early, early years. Right? That's when all of this is happening. Constantine becomes the first Christian ruler 300 AD ish, right? And it's at that point that our worship services become formalized. Even though they don't have a Bible yet, right? They're starting to translate these letters. And these gospels into other languages. Okay? Remember this because we've talked about this a few times. One of the earliest translations of the Bible was uh, from Greek because that's how these letters were written originally. And they were all written, once again, 40s, 50s, 60s, right? The oldest one being, you know, close to 100, being Revelation, all that other stuff. But those letters, they were written in the Greek language. And now they start to translate them with Constantine. Before Constantine, right here. So these 100s, 200 AD, they begin translating them into different languages. And I want you to see that something happens, right? And they begin to translate them into Latin. They begin to translate them into German. Those are the first two languages they translated this Greek language to. And the word church is the Greek word ekklesia. And this is where we totally messed up everything. Because ekklesia never referred to a specific place. It was never about a building, Ecclesia was simply about a gathering or an assembly of people who came together for a common specific purpose. That's what the word means. But in the Latin, they translated ecclesia with basilica. Basilica is a very specific location. And in the German, it was Kirksha, right? Which was a very specific location. So ecclesia, which was never about a location, begins to translate into a specific location. A gathering of people, but now it's a place where you can lock the doors. The word church is not translated from the Greek. It's a substitution for the Greek, and it's a bad one. So the question we should be asking ourselves is, if the Greek word means gathering, why doesn't our English Bible say gathering? 
It's a good question. Instead, it just simply says church. And I'll give you the answer. It's a great question. I'll give you the answer as short as possible. It's a really long story. But in a nutshell, once Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire, once again, these early 300 ADs, worship became a program. Worship became a formula. It was no longer an expanding group of people sharing a unique identity, sharing a unique purpose. It became a location. And by 400 A.D., we actually had our Bible, but only the rich could afford to have one because they were all handwritten. And by the way, most of the people couldn't read anyway, so they would gather in that one location, the church, so that they could hear the Bible. And if you've ever studied our human history (laughs) from the 400s to about the 1500s, they were not good times for human history. We refer to the dark ages for a reason, right? And we have all these corrupt leaders and these powerful politicians who now see the church as a way to raise money and to promote propaganda and to manipulate people. We didn't have a Bible. We didn't know any different. We couldn't read for ourselves. How were we supposed to know? So we gathered in one location and got and received all of this. Things changed a thousand years later when we get a printing press and we begin to have Bibles that are actually affordable and people begin to read them for yourselves. The Reformation happens. There's a split between the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church. But even though it has been 1,700 plus years and even though we all have our Bible in hundreds of different translations, we read it. And we worship the way not set up by the apostles, not set up by Jesus, not set up by the Bible itself, but set up by human leaders. Because church is a place. It is not a movement. And so once again, I have this angst. We have accepted church to be what we have experienced, not what it should be. And that's a problem for me. Because now we have, well, this is how you should do it, right? And all of a sudden we try to do church on a Tuesday night and a Friday night, and people call me a heretic and a cult leader. You would not believe the things that I've endured over these 18 years. Because how dare you not have church on a Sunday morning? They can't handle it being different. Because we've been conditioned that this is what church is. So therefore, anything that is not this in this program, it is not church. But you have your Bibles in your hands. You read that. You see what the early church did. And you see how God moved them mightily. And I think if we follow that model, God would use us mightily. But we've been conditioned, every single one of us, we've been conditioned to believe that church needs to be on a Sunday morning for an hour where you have two to four songs, you read for the Bible, and then there's this three-point sermon. And before you have church, you go to Sunday school for an hour. And if you're old school on Wednesday nights, you also have a program. And heck, if you're Baptist, you also have a Sunday night prayer gathering, which is just the sermon part two, right? Am I, am I lying to anybody? Okay. You all know that. If you grew up in the church, you've all had these experiences. The problem is, my friends, it doesn't work. It's the problem. It's not reaching people who don't believe in Jesus. People who don't believe in Jesus look at this program and they look at a Sunday morning and they, they look at all the things that are wrong with the church and they look at the politics of the church and they, they look at the money of the church and they look at all of this stuff and, and they go, man, that just, that doesn't work for me. You know what that program works for? It works for people who are Christians. It works for churchy people. It works for the 60 plus crowd because, well, that's what they've done their entire life. No criticism to the 60 plus. I'm just saying it works for you because that's exactly how you've been raised, right? Sunday, Sunday school, Sunday church, Sunday night, Wednesday night. I mean, you know, so even switching to a Tuesday, Friday was just a whirlwind for you, right? People have given up on church. 
people have given up on Jesus. So what are we going to do about it? What are we absolutely going to do about it? Because there are millions of people who are dying without knowing a Savior. There are millions of people who are living lives of pain and hurt who don't know that there is an answer and His name is Jesus. There are millions of people who have been hurt, hurt by this thing that we call church. They are the ones we actually started this community for 18 years ago. And the world has changed. And we have done many changes to try to meet those needs. But it's not enough. We have to continue to change. Jesus gives us the great commission. Some of Jesus' last words on earth, he told his disciples to go into the world's But we as the church, we've said, come and hear what we have to say. We stop going into the world. And that's just not right. So we as the elders, we've been sitting around and we've been praying and we've been dreaming. And I asked them uh, them a couple months ago, so why do you come to church? I mean, why? You know, it's amazing. Not one of them said to hear what you have to say, Todd? I'm no dummy. I know you're not here for me. I know you're going to forget 95% of what I said when you walk out that door. I know that. Okay? So why in the world do they come? And they said, because of community. Because relationships. Because I feel loved. Because I feel like I'm a part of a family. Ah, yes. That's why people come to church. Because they feel like they are a part of a family. And they are loved and they are accepted and they are cared for. That's church. That's ecclesia. This is why we do church. And what did the early church do? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They gathered in community. They shared meals together and they prayed together. And as a result of that, God blessed them. And where did they do that? In a big church building? They did that in each other's homes. Can you imagine that first day? Peter looking at John going, we're going to need a bigger house. We have 3,000 people here, and there's like 30 of us. All right, so you each get to take 100 people home with you tonight. This is going to be great, right? Can you imagine the problem that they had that night? Uh, And it's a good problem. It's a good problem to have. Is there music playing? Sweet. All right. Awesome. Okay. I was like, I'm getting a soundtrack. I've never talked to a soundtrack. That's awesome. All right. In those homes, they lived life together. What is the vision statement of Waypoints? Charting a course through life together. What makes Waypoints unique? It's us being together. What makes it special? This community. Guys, I'm going to tell you, we love people unlike any other place I've ever been. We're really good at loving people. We're really good at accepting people. We're really good at empowering people. We're really good at encouraging people. But they got to come in the building first. And that's a problem. Because there's people outside of the church who are disconnected from Jesus who want and need the intimate connection that we can offer, that want and need this connection with Jesus. And I'm going to tell you guys, they're not looking at the big mega church productions for their connection with Jesus. They're not. You know who's looking for that connection? People who are already believers. Like, I want to go see the smoke machine, and, the, and I, I want the pastor to row out on a boat, and I, I'm looking for these things. Man, you should just get on YouTube for a while, man. Oh, man. It's raining on stage and all these huge productions. This is great. 
God bless, I mean, God's going to use whatever he uses, and those people, I'm, not, I'm not trying to criticize that. But I'm saying that people who do not believe in Jesus, who are not connected to a church, they're not going to those big productions saying, let me be introduced to Jesus. They're looking to their coworkers, and they're looking to their neighbors, and they're looking to people who claim to be Jesus followers and wanting to see if they can see Jesus They're not looking in the production. Church people look at the production as a show. And in their minds, that communicates fake. And this current expression of Christianity where we come, we sit, and we soak up the experience where we listen to a speaker is a Greek-Roman way of doing things that have been done for 1,700-plus years, and our culture is tired of it. And all you have to do is look at our education system and see how much that's changing. Because to sit in rows in a desk and listen to a talking head up front teacher, I've been a teacher 25 years, I can say that, all right? That ain't working for people. That's why people are bouncing for the public school system. Let me try it online. Let me try co-op. Let me try a homeschool. Let me try a private school. Let me try something. Because this form of you just sitting there and listening to this talking head does not work. And the world is discovering it. And even education is moving away from it. We have to engage people in the culture, which is what the book of Titus is all about. Engaging that culture. You and I live in a multimedia, virtual TikTok world, and it is not going away. And if you have been listening to me over the last couple of years, that 5% that you retain, I have been saying that house church is the future of the church. It is. It's where the Spirit of God is moving. Now, house churches do have some inherent flaws. They do. First and foremost, house churches typically do not have good, solid biblical teachers. And sometimes some really bad biblical teaching happens, some, some heresy, that's the word for it. And one of the blessings of the last couple hundred years is seminaries train people and train them really well. But house churches are supposed to exist of about 12 people. And the person who is hosting... I mean, if you think you can handle more than 12 at your house church, but Jesus could only handle 12, then we probably should talk. All right, moving on. All right. He can handle 12. That's, that's it. And he lost one of them. All right, I don't want to tell you. All right, so the person house, uh, hosting that house church is supposed to be busy leading their normal, average, everyday life. They don't have time to sit here and study the Scriptures, right? And so sometimes, a lot of times, House churches don't have the solid biblical teaching because they don't have time to devote to it, okay? And it's actually that house host living in the world, living their life, which is attractive to other people because, like, there's something different about you. Yes, that difference is Jesus. Come over to my house for supper and we'll talk about it, all right? The second inherent flaw of house churches is sometimes that house church becomes a person's pet project. Because they want to be a pastor and they want to start their own church. So instead of being a part of a network of churches like we see here in Titus, like we see in Acts chapter 2, people have their own agenda and they drive it. And it isn't towards unity and it isn't towards serving people and it isn't towards the body of Christ. It's towards I want to make my own church. That's been a knock on house churches. And the third knock that has been on house churches is they become really clicky. And so it becomes territorial. It's not about actually helping other people. It's about really what I want, really about what I need, which is what large churches become about. Well, you know, I really like this music, and the temperature needs to be at uh, 69 degrees, and we need to have this, and I want a fog machine. And it becomes about our own comfort and our own what I want, right? And so house churches can do that, and it becomes about a group of friends, not about a mission for Jesus, Now, not all of that is bad because we need deep community, we need deep friends, we need deep relationship. It only becomes bad when we lose sight of the fact that there's other people around us without Jesus. 
And in Acts chapter 2, we see people able to gather their resources, be together as a network, and serve other people. So, once again, a house church needs to be biblically solid with teaching. It needs to be part of a larger network working together for a larger cause to change the city. And it needs to be focused on loving and serving people regardless of whether or not they go to your house church. That's really what needs to happen. And that's what we see here in the book of Titus, which is why we're studying it. It's also what we're seeing here in Acts chapter 2, and it's also what I'm going to do and what I'm asking you to join me in doing. And so over the next month, we're going to use Titus and our times together here on a Friday night to unpack what Waypoint's network of house churches looks like and how it works. Because I'm not here to do church. I'm here to be the church. And I want to do whatever it takes to help people come to Jesus. So this coming Tuesday night, August 2nd, just a couple days, we're going to ask for the worship team and the children's teachers and anyone who is interested, anyone in a leadership position and anyone who is interested in being a part of this network to come here. And we're going to share a meal together. And we're going to talk and we're going to pray. And we're going to have a Q&A time. And we're going to talk about what this looks like for each ministry area and how we can band together to change this city for Jesus. And then we're going to launch our house churches the last week of August as you and I start the Gospel of Mark. And we will have a kickoff in the park on Labor Day from 4 to 7 where you can invite everybody you want to invite to your house church. And we're going to play games and I'm going to kick somebody's butt at cornhole and we might do some acoustic worship and we're going to have a night and we're going to say, this is what we're going to do. Because this isn't just the future of the church, it's the future of us. And it's going to change things. And a lot of us aren't necessarily going to like change. Because it's not going to be comfortable for us. But it really isn't about your comfort. It's about the gospel. It's about Jesus. It's about people coming to Jesus. It's about being a community. Now, I know you have lots and lots of questions. So, come on Tuesday night, and we'll unpack with some very practical, this is what it looks like, and we'll answer your questions and those sorts of things. But, for right now, I'm going to let that just marinate in your heart. I'm going to let you think on that. We're going to repackage this video we're going to stream it for House Church. We're going to put it on all of our platforms. And just let this roll around in your heart. And I'm going to pray for you. And I'm going to pray for me. And I'm going to pray for our city. And we're going to transition our time. All right? Would you please join me? If we could just turn the lights blue, go to that worship transition on, these house, uh, on the stage lights. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask, because I'm just going to stay right here. Sorry, worship team. I'm just going to stay right here for a few. I'm going to ask that every single person here, I normally don't ask this, I just invite. But I'm just going to ask you, if you would put your hands out like this. Body language has a whole lot to say. And sometimes we're like, I'm not sure that I like this. This is what we do. And we close ourselves off to what God wants to do. So I'm going to ask if, that you'd open yourself up. And let's spend a few moments praying. As we adjust our wind to the sails of the blowing of God, I don't know all what it's going to look like. We have some basic ideas. We have some things we feel strongly about, and we're going to move in that direction. Because I'd rather move in a direction towards Jesus than sit in a spot and watch Jesus walk away. I'm not going to do that. 
So may you and I be open to a fresh moving of God. I hope you are. I pray you are. Lord Jesus, we come before you tonight. A lot was said here tonight. Some of it was offensive. Some of it pricked our hearts. Some of it, some of it's right on. There's something inside of our soul that feels that angst to what we read in your word and what we experience. We're like, there's a disconnect. I don't understand. What's the disconnect? It must be me. And we take all that pressure on ourselves. When it's not, maybe it's just church. Maybe it's just what we've accepted as church. And so, Lord, I just want to pray that you would come and you would speak to every single one of us. Church needs to change, Jesus. Church needs to change. Because a world is leaving and a world is living without you. And we have to take responsibility for that. We have to take responsibility for that. So, Lord Jesus, we come before you and we beg you for your Holy Spirit to anoint us, for your Holy Spirit to descend upon us, for your Holy Spirit to speak in our hearts, in our minds, scream because we're so deaf. We're so deaf because of our own points of view. We're so deaf because we don't like change. We're so deaf because we're just stuck in a rut. You're going to need to shout to us, Jesus. And I ask and I beg that you do that. And as we meet on Tuesday and as we gather again on Friday and as we continue just to unpack this over the next couple of, of weeks, month, and just wrestle through all of this, Lord God, would you guide us as a community? May we seek first your kingdom and your righteousness above all. And it's in your precious and holy name that we pray and all of God's people said, amen. amen.